and 11 minutes remaining in this built-in hold. The ice team is at the pad doing their inspections at this time and is reporting some limited ice found in the on the external tank but uh, not of any consequence. We are now in the breakfast room at the astronaut quarters where the STS-31 crew is having breakfast. Mission specialist Dr. Steve Hawley who will be deploying the telescope from the remote manipulator arm. Colonel Charlie Bolden, the pilot on this mission. The commander, Lauren Schreiber, for the space shuttle Discovery. Dr. Kathy Sullivan, mission specialist. And Captain, Navy Captain Bruce McCandless, mission specialist. The mission emblem on the cake on the breakfast table, which is discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope on a field of planets, stars, and galaxies. After breakfast, they will receive a weather briefing and then don their flight suits and depart for the pad about 5.15 this morning. This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours and holding, approximately nine minutes remaining in this built-in hold. We are watching the astronauts suit up. This is Commander Lauren Schreiber having his helmet attached. Schreiber is an Air Force Colonel and is the mission commander. Here's Marine Colonel Charlie Bolden, the pilot, also having his helmet and communications attachments completed. On the other side of the room is mission specialist Dr. Catherine Sullivan awaiting the helmet attachment, otherwise her suit up is essentially complete. Here is Navy Captain Bruce McCandless. McCandless and Kathy Sullivan will be doing the contingency EVA on this flight should one be necessary. And Dr. Steve Hawley ready to go. He will be operate, operating the remote manipulator arm to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope on flight day two. The crew now headed for the elevator that will take them down to the first floor where they'll board the Astrovan for the 20 minute ride out to pad B. Commander and the pilot, Commander Shriver and pilot Charlie Bolden, Bruce McCandless, and members of the support team that will be going out. There is uh, the crew headed down the elevator and momentarily we'll see them boarding the Astrovan. And numerous KSC employees usually wait by the walkway to greet them as they head out. This is a view of the orbiter access arm, and we can see our five-member flight crew crossing from the fixed service structure into the white room, where they will be assisted by the closeout team and other astronaut support crew members. Commander Lauren Schreiber has just Enter the access hatch of Discovery, assisted by the closeout crew. Pilot Charlie Bolden will be next. And as they enter their seats and begin their communications checks, we'll be hearing those checks being conducted. Hello, 
OTC, uh, CDR, how do you read? Uh, CDR, read you loud and clear, help me. Hey, you're loud and clear this morning. Good morning, Lauren. Understand. NTZ, CDR, how do you read this morning? Uh, read you loud and clear, Lauren, help me. Loud and clear, And Houston, uh, CDR, how do you read? CDR, Houston, good morning, Lauren, you're loud and clear. And you're loud and clear also, Steve. OTC, OVCC. Go ahead. Yeah, our last crew member is boarding at this time. Copy that. Houston, MS-1, radio check over. MS-1, Houston, you're loud and clear. Good morning, Bruce. Uh, good morning. Uh, looks like a nice day down here. That's good. We're working on other places. OTC, OVCC. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Up support set up 20. Side hatch closed out and white room configuration is complete. We're ready to clear the pad. Okay. T-minus 7 minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. Yeah, let's go for orbiter access arm retract. This arm can be re-extended in less than half a minute if that's necessary. May upon T-minus 5 minutes and counting. We have a go for APU start. APU, please. That's what's Stanley. Final purge sequence of the main engines is in work. We're now transferring to internal power and switching off the orbiter's ground power supply. At this point, Discovery is being powered by the onboard fuel cells. Standing by now, here is the retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent hood. The gimbling of the main engines is complete, and the aerosurfaces have been verified that they are positioned for launch. The external tank now is reported to be at flight pressure. Close and lock your visors and initiate your O2 flow, and you all have a good trip. Roger that. Tenward. Standing by now for a go for auto sequence start. T minus 33. Tap on clock will hold at T minus 31 seconds. Failure. What has happened is the ground launch sequencer would not hand off to the orbiter's computers to complete the count because the liquid oxygen fill and drain valve was showing off when it should be on. There's the confirmation that we have successfully recycled. We are go for start. Booster hydraulic power units have started. 20. Sound suppression water system has started. 15. T minus 13 seconds. 10. T minus 10, Welcome go for main engine start. start. We are go for main engine start. T minus 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Mission Control, Houston. Roll program. Roger, roll, Discovery. The roll maneuver puts the vehicle in the proper launch plane. Guidance officer confirms a good roll maneuver. Engines now throttling back.
The throttle down maneuver assists in reducing the aerodynamic loads on Discovery as it passes through the area of not maximum dynamic pressure. Velocity now 1,200 feet per second. Discovery downrange three nautical miles. Discovery, go and throttle up. All three engines now throttle back up. Go and throttle up. Engines at 104 percent. The go at throttle up call signifies that all systems are performing well. All three auxiliary power units look good. Discovery's velocity now 2,300 feet per second and is downrange 8 nautical miles. Standing by for SRB separation. And both solid rocket boosters have separated. Discovery's velocity now 4,300 feet per second at a downrange distance of 35 nautical miles. Booster officer reports all three engines stable at 104% performance. Discovery Houston, performance is nominal. Discovery Houston. You have a go to open the doors. Uh, Roger, Houston. Houston, Discovery. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, Ox, you guys can probably see. It looks like uh, that Ox deucer on the left domes is uh, kind of getting noisy, and it's tripping the, the uh, caution and warning. Roger that. Stand by, Charlie. We're talking about it. Uh, no action for you right yet. Houston, Discovery. Go ahead, Charlie. Yes, yeah, Steve, we'd like to know if we can go ahead and uh, get a jump on KU Band Deploy. That's affirmative, Charlie. You have a go for KU Band Deploy. And Houston, uh all the IMU line stuff uh, was complete. Roger that, Lauren. Uh, we've been watching here. The IMUs look good, and uh, we concur that you're complete. And this is Mission Control Houston at three hours, two minutes into the flight of Discovery. Uh, we're now seeing uh, payload bay views from camera A. That's on the forward bulkhead of Discovery looking aft. Uh, we're seeing the uh, remote, remote manipulator system arm as it is uh, put through its uh, paces uh, being checked out for tomorrow's activities uh, related to the Hubble Space Telescope. Discovery Houston, we're getting some real good payload bay television downlink, and we see that Steve has been hard at work getting the RMS deployed. Okay, he's uh, getting a good start at the RMS checkout right now. Roger, Lauren. This is Mission Control. Uh, Mission Specialist Steve Hawley uh, continuing to take the uh, RMS through its uh, checkout procedures. We are looking at the end effector as it is run through the uh, snare drive test. The uh, end effector will be used uh, to grapple the uh, Hubble Space Telescope tomorrow and uh, will be used to release the telescope. 
and the end effector is uh, about 13 inches in diameter. Go ahead, Discovery. Roger, Jim. Uh, we think RMS checkout is complete. We think the uh, arm is full up. We didn't see any anomalies at all. That sounds great, Steve, and we concur. Discovery, Houston just wanted to let you know that the ground is currently configured for HST main bus activation. So we're ready when you are. Uh, Houston, uh, we just put the main bus power on. Roger, Lauren. We copy. Good morning, outer space, from all the human race, it's time to stow your sleeping gear. We know you had a blast, you're up in space at last, now your main objective's clear. Discovery. Your wake-up music today is compliments of your training team. We want you to make them proud today. Discovery, Houston. Good morning, Story. Good morning, Discovery. Good morning from Bill Reeves and Orbit One team, and you got a goal for HST Deploy Ops. This is Mission Control Houston. This uh, digital animation being fed by live telemetry depicting the motion of the robot arm as Mission Specialist Steve Hawley uh, begins to put it through its paces. This live view coming from the forward port uh, bulkhead camera aboard Discovery uh, gives us a look at the real thing. Uh, Steve Hawley has unberthed the arm and has begun to move it into position for grapple of the Hubble Space Telescope. This is Mission Control Houston. Our PDRS officer here in the flight control room confirms uh, via telemetry that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has been grappled. This is Mission Control Houston. We're continuing to take live television from the shuttle Discovery, this from the uh, aft flight deck of the vehicle as uh, Mission Specialist Kathy Sullivan continues uh, to prepare for deploy operations uh, at this point, uh, uh, beginning to set up photographic equipment on the flight deck uh, to uh, document the deploy activities. Discovery Houston. Go ahead, Story. You got a goal to release the Perlers and a goal to transfer Hubble to internal power on time. Roger that. Understand. Go for perler release and go for transfer to internal power on time. That's firm.
Discovery, you're go for umbilical disconnect. We copy that, go for umbilical disconnect. It's firm. In this solar array deploy attitude uh, that Discovery is in at the time, uh, which has uh, the sun constantly off the nose of the orbiter Discovery, the image in the uh, majority of the field of view is reflection of the forward bulkhead in the uh, metallic aperture door of the telescope. You know, pitch is uh, about four degrees off, attitude-wise. Okay. Um, maybe that's what make, what's making it look like that. You're going to pitch it up. Okay. I see you coming up. How does it look out your window as far as clearance? Because that's the only thing oh, you can't see. Really I can't see out your window either. Um, that show us about two inches starboard. Good clearance. Still looks good. And the, uh, it's about an inch forward, but I think that may be pitch. Pitch again kind of yeah. sagged. It's 355 right now. looks like I want to go to starboard. Starboard, yeah. I'd go ahead and do it. As you got over here, I, I can see uh, lots of clearance. Come in starboard nicely. Charlie coming in over your shoulder. A little bit more. Okay, hey, still coming. Okay. What's my uh, Z? Okay, Z is minus 538. And it's coming up nicely. And this is Hubble Telescope Control in Greenbelt. Uh, we have uh, been given the go-ahead to begin commanding uh, release of the forward latches, which hold the uh, solar arrays in place during launch along the side of the telescope. The forward latches are on both sides, both the port and starboard side of the telescope are uh, released simultaneously. No need to acknowledge the forward latches are in motion. Roger, Houston, we copy. Discovery will take this attitude right here. I'd like you to go free drift for PDM deploy. Roger, free drift. This is Hubble Telescope Control Greenbelt, one day, one hour, 54 minutes, mission elapsed time. Continuing to receive television through the uh, uh, Vandenberg uh, tracking station. And uh, it is clearly showing the uh, deployment of the uh, solar array masts uh, with the uh, solar array package uh, in the stowed position. The arrays are wound uh, much like uh, a pair of window shades around a, a, a roller and uh, kept in that configuration for launch. And uh, once the uh, primary deployment activity has been completed, the crew uh, uh, tweaks the attitude uh, and, and replaces the uh, vehicle in free drift. Uh, the uh, operations team here will begin uh, commanding the uh, solar array blankets to unfurl.
discovery in order to preserve an Orbit 20 release. We'd like you to get into EVA prep. Okay, uh, we're proceeding with that. Thank you. We see uh, both high gains moving. Thank you, Lauren. And as Commander Lauren Shriver uh, just confirmed what uh, our data screens are showing here in the control center that uh, the motors are in operation and the uh, two high gain antenna mass are in the process of swinging 90 degrees to the perpendicular position. Discovery, go free drift or plus SDM deploy. crew just confirmed uh, we're seeing uh, both blankets beginning to unfurl on the port side solar uh, array. So far we see good smooth motion uh, both sides. And we got TV down here, Lauren. Roger that. The solar arrays are driven out of their cassettes by uh, by stems, uh, which are at each side of the array. Uh, the by stem uh, is visible in the uh, television being downlinked from the spacecraft at this time. It's attached at the end of the array to a spreader bar, and the spreader bar is in turn attached to, to the array, which uh, uh, literally pulls the array out of the cassette which held it uh, packaged during launch. fully deployed both of the arrays together produce about 6,000 volts, about half of which uh, is required to operate telescope systems and during the daylight side of the pass the other half is uh, used to recharge the six nickel hydrogen batteries. Shift Supervisor Pete Patero just uh, checking with uh, his control team receiving a report that uh, from the ground, as confirmed by the crew from orbit, the uh, deploy activity so far is going very smoothly. Uh, we see uh, no indications of any problems at this time. Discovery, you can go auto Vern. We're setting up for the other array. Okay, we'll go auto Vern. That's firm. Discovery used. Go ahead. We're looking more and more like an uh, Orbit 20 release. We'd like you to press on with the EVA prep. Okay, we copy. Uh, we'll press on with that. Discovery, your aperture door latch is open. Copy that, story, thank you. And uh, status for you, Houston, uh, Charlie's 
downstairs in the process of getting uh, Bruce and Kathy buttoned up in the suits. Aviating copies, and we're watching the fans come on. Discovery, we'd like free drift for minus SDM deploy. Okay, we copy free drift. It's firm. Okay, you're at free drift now. Thank you. We see motion. So do we, Lauren. As the uh, blankets uh, begin deploying, the uh, orbital verification team is watching very closely the tension being placed on those uh, wings so far. Uh, looking good. Houston Discovery, it looks like motion stopped with uh, just about one panel showing. And we see that too, Lauren. The DCE is off. This is Mission Control Houston. Flight controllers here in uh, Mission Control Center discussing an impending deadline. Uh, within about 13 minutes, we will reach a point of having concluded the pre-breathe and in order to provide enough rapid response time to support an EVA, we would need to begin depressurizing the airlock in about uh, 12 to 13 minutes from now. The other thing I need an answer to is if I can go ahead and commit the EVA with the thought of going out and cranking it out if, the, if whatever they're about to do fails. They want us to just press on to back them up. We need to get on with it. Okay, flight, I'll come back with the answer. And I need answers now. Flight, I fail. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't feel comfortable waiting until... After I don't either. That's why I want the answers now. Yeah, 620 is the, my drop dead time from adding up all the times. Okay, I'm going to have them press on. All right, Capcom, tell the crew we want them to press on into EVA, and Flight. we'll stop them whenever we have to. Just quickly, we got four minutes on this pass. Discovery used. Discovery, go ahead. Okay, with the panels that you got out there right now, it's not satisfactory to stay overnight. So we're going to have to move out on the EVA. Okay, sorry. Discovery, Houston. Discovery, go ahead. We think there may be some problem with the tension monitoring software. We've got the DCE back on. We're going to disable the tension monitoring and resend the proc to deploy the minus SDM. Okay. Hit it. Okay, Houston, we see motion. We've got the image down here, Lauren. It's fully deployed. The micro switches confirm it. Okay. And for Bruce and Kathy, we'd like you to stop the airlock depress at five, please. Okay, they copy the story, and we're uh, at five point five right now. Okay, Charlie. to the release attitude right now. That's in the cap page 3-20. Okay, 
Stage 3-20 will maneuver to the uh, release attitude. That's firm. Rendezvous? We're go. Fado, go. Eagle? Go. Peacock? Go. Enco? We're go. FAO? Go. Max? Go. PRS? Go flight. EVA? We're go. Sergeant, you're still go? Go. GC? Go. Network, go. Payloads, waiting on you. Flight payloads, we are go. go. Capcom, we have a go for release. Discovery, go for hover release. Okay, we have a go for release, and we're going to be a minute late. Okay, Charlie. Houston, Discovery. Go ahead, Charlie. Okay, Story, uh, we've been taking marks. Um, residuals and ratios look good, and we'd like to go ahead and uh, go to filter state. We concur, Charlie. Uh, Story, I was taking pictures. You want, uh, I may have missed your call. You want, uh, want to go ahead and uh, do RMS power down so we can get the guys out of the airlock set up for them? But that's at your convenience, Steve. But once we do have the RMS stowed, then we'll back out of EVA. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what, we'll spend just a few more minutes then getting some pictures here. Yes, sir. Do just that. You've been so good to me, uh. you've been so good to me, uh. you know you make me want to lift my head up and throw my head back and come on now, come on now. Morning Discovery. I guess you're awake after that song. Uh, there are a lot of happy people down here. We saw a great deploy yesterday, and Hubble had a good night while you were asleep. Tell Hootie you better find that guy and sign him up for Max Q that did the uh, wake-up music. And we're here this morning to perform student experiment 82-16 for Greg Peterson. This is a, an experiment designed to investigate what effects gravity-driven buoyancy may have on the behavior of an electrical arc as you observe it on the ground in 1G, say, during a Jacob's Ladder experiment in high school. And that is exactly, in fact, the kind of experiment that first gave this idea to Greg. What you see on your right here, taped to the forward lockers, is the arc chamber itself, and the Aeroflex camera is set up to look into the arc. There are mirrors behind the arc so that you get, in fact, three different views of it. The first thing we're going to do here is photograph the arc behavior in the ambient magnetic fields of the orbiter. And we, in fact, will look at three different orientations. The path of the arc, as the experiment is currently placed, goes parallel to the orbiter's y-axis through the wings. We will then rotate the box and camera 90 degrees to look at the orbiter's z-axis, vertical, like this. And then again, we will rotate it 90 degrees and tape it on the overhead panel so that we can look at the ambient magnetic field parallel to the vehicle's z-axis. We'll show you this a little bit. We have actually, um, as you can tell, turned the power on and we have actually applied a magnetic field. So we're stepping through the fields. The reason we think you see a very finely defined arc on your right is because that's the tip of a nail. Uh, the other uh, part of 
the arc system is actually the round head of a nail, and we think that the uh, that the arc is just or the charge is just kind of jumping around from place to place on the head of the nail, and that's what allows it to go that way. But if you guys can get Greg to come in, he can probably tell you whether we're right or wrong. But we did notice uh, that the behavior of the arc became more and more erratic, and its uh, amplitude increased as the as the field went up. And just as they had told us to keep light, once you put a charge into the system, uh, it never comes out of there. So even when we go back to no field at all, we still had the erratic behavior on the arc. Okay, thank you, Charlie. That's over we're looking at, huh? Yes, sir. And through the uh, gyro-stabilized binoculars, I convinced myself that I could still make out the orientation of the solar rays. Fantastic. Discovery for Max Q's keyboard. That's the way that song should really be done. Your next practice is Sunday evening in the gym. Don't be late. We're getting TV down here. Is that lightning that you see down there? That is extreme lightning. That's correct. Boy, you bet. CCTVs. I've never seen them pick it up like that. This is the Hubble Telescope Control in Greenbelt. Commands have been uh, sent up to uh, open the aperture door. And we have confirmation that the motor is running on the door and the door is beginning to open. Have uh, confirmation from the stock that the uh, aperture door is open. Okay, thank you, Steve. You know what that is, I bet. Not only what it is, but whose it is. How much do you think it's worth to him to have it back? And it's still running, too. Well, that, that watch gets two rides for the price of one. Absolutely. Story, uh, what we wanted to do was uh, say uh, a uh, little bit of well-deserved thanks to our training team who worked really so hard with us uh, for uh, actually quite a long time, a uh, couple of years while I've been with the crew anyway. So uh, we uh, really appreciate all the long hours and late hours and, and all the hard work that they did. And uh, 
it's really paid off, we believe. And we'd like to thank them for uh, the uh, little cards they gave us to uh, read while we're here on orbit. They're very appropriate. And uh, we'd just like to let them know that all's going well. We're feeling great. And to uh, give Becky a special thanks. Okay, I'm sure they're watching. If they don't happen to be right now, I will call them. Let me start with a, a little bit of a perspective comment. Uh, many of us were assigned to this crew back in 1985 and have been working like many others on the telescope project for a long time to bring this mission off. And we, again, as many others, have thought numerous times about the historical significance that the advent in a, of an observatory such as the HST uh, would have and how it stands in comparison to the advances of Galileo and even to the advances of uh, Edwin Hubble's periods of observation. And in searching for some way to possibly commemorate that or betoken that during our flight, uh, I happened upon the idea that there must be some astronomical artifact from one of the observatories uh, Hubble worked on that we possibly could take along as memento. And with some considerable assistance from the Smithsonian Museum, we managed to obtain this device, which is the guiding eyepiece, we are assured, from the 100-inch telescope on which uh, Edwin Hubble did many of his observations out at Mount Wilson in California, so it's his fundamental work, in fact. We uh, have it with us here, as I said, courtesy of the Smithsonian and the American Astronomical Society. It was, in fact, presented to the crew at the 100th anniversary meeting of the AAS back in January. It's a great pleasure to have something of such historical significance and something that so directly symbolizes Edwin Hubble's fundamental contributions to astronomy. As you can see, as Orion sets, that... Uh the stars are gradually dimmed as they pass through the Earth's atmosphere, which is, of course, the problem that Earth-bound astronomers have faced for a long time. Not only does it diminish and spread out the amount of light that you can see, but additionally, the uh, atmosphere is not transparent to all wavelengths that are of interest scientifically, and Hubble Space Telescope will be able to observe wavelengths both short and longer of the wavelengths that uh, are visible to uh, telescopes on the ground. There is nothing in the void where the bang closed the hole in the middle of it all. There's nothing in the void where the bang closed the hole in the middle of it all. There's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole in the middle of it all. And now I'm looking for the nothing in the void where the bang closed the hole in the middle of it all. I'm looking for the nothing in the void where the bang closed the hole in the middle of it all. There's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole in the middle of it all. There's a hole, there's a hole. Assuming the theory holds, there's a hole in the middle of it all. This is something like eight TV tests at once. There's a, a uh, certain toxin on each one of those sets of tines, and the idea is to determine whether the body's response to uh, immune system response varies at all in zero G. Uh, some of the body's immune response, of course, is governed by the, the blood system, and another level of it is controlled uh, by the cellular structure of the body. And the objective of this experiment specifically was to look at cell-mediated immune response. And uh, Houston, Discovery, uh, we're ready to close payload bay doors, uh, if you still are. All right, to that. We were just uh, talking about that. And the fest looks good, and you have a go for payload bay door closing. This is Mission Control. Crew's been given the go for payload bay door closing uh, based on the uh, possibility that weather forecasters will be able to revise the forecast downward on wind conditions for Edwards later this morning for our landing opportunity. Discovery Houston, we've taken a look at the weather. Weatherman says it's going to hang in there. You have a go to pro to ops 302. Go to maneuver to burn attitude and a go for the burn. Roger that. Go for the burn.
We uh, have an exciting discovery on the long-range optics from De Vandenberg Air Force Base. Discovery's velocity now Mach 6, altitude 133,000 feet, 181 miles away from Edwards. Discover Houston, state vector transfer to the BFS, please. Transfer inward. Discovery now at uh, 14,000 feet, making the final approach, lining up over runway 22. And Discovery is on the glide slope, converging on the center line. Coming up uh, now for the pre-flare maneuver at uh, 2,500 feet. Current altitude about 6,800 feet. Landing gear is down and locked. Main gear touchdown. Nose gear touchdown. Discovery rolls out on runway 22 at Edwards at the end of uh, mission STS-31 after traveling 2,068,213 statute miles on this mission. Mechanical systems officer reports steady braking. The normal amount of braking is about 8 to 10 feet per second. And uh, this detailed test objective today is designed to be a light braking or low energy braking to try out the new carbon brakes. We'll stop. Houston Discovery, we'll stop. Roger that Discovery, welcome back. Congratulations on a super mission. And the world is looking forward to reaping the benefits of your good work over the next 15 years. Welcome back, guys, and we have no post-landing deltas. Okay, thank you, Steve, and uh, we sure uh, enjoyed it also. It was great fun. It sure looked like it.